This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. This episode is brought to you by BNC Pro, the brand spanking new digital wealth platform featuring an all-in-one suite of customizable institutional grade applications that help you manage your crypto investments. Yes, research, chart, screen, analyze, optimize, report and more. BNC Pro is the ultimate portfolio tool for individual or enterprise use. Streamline your workflow, manage your crypto and master this brave new asset class your way with BNC Pro. Go to bnc-pro.com now to create your free account or just look for the link in the show notes to this episode. Now on with the show. My guest today is Vance Spencer from San Francisco based Framework Ventures. Framework Ventures is a thesis driven venture firm that partners with founders and teams to build token based networks and develop the requisite crypto economics, governance and community needed to scale. Welcome to the show Vance. Hey, thanks for thanks for having me. Today's show this is really about DeFi, decentralized finance and you and your team at Framework have a really strong conviction in DeFi. We'll explore your DeFi thesis and, and what DeFi is, but just before we do that, why don't you just briefly introduce yourself, lay out some background, and tell us a, a little bit more about how you set up Framework. Yeah, so uh, great to be here. Um, Framework is, is Michael Anderson and myself. We come from traditional tech. So Michael was a PM at Snapchat and Dropbox and studied, studied computer science at Yale. I ran corporate strategy at Netflix in Tokyo uh, for the Asia business. And before that, I was a management consultant. So we really do come at crypto and DeFi from a different angle than most. And, and that's just kind of, you know, influenced by our experience with consumer internet. In terms of, you know, DeFi and how we think about it, you know, we see DeFi as you know, not this kind of weird niche within cryptocurrency, but we really see it as a subsector of um, fintech investing. You know, our thesis is is pretty basic. We have, you know, a, an understanding and a, and a conviction in that the next generation of, of really big breakout uh, consumer financial technology applications or or or. Uh, or, or protocols, uh, they'll be powered by blockchain. And we kind of break up the landscape into a few different subsectors, you know, uh, margin trading, futures, far lend, you know, synthetic assets, AMMs. Uh, but we really do approach it from a, from a traditional uh, technology perspective of, you know, these things are, are effectively, you know, consumer applications and, and we're building and investing for that type of future. Yeah, that's nicely said. And I think that's quite interesting, especially as, you know, you mentioned that you were doing strategy at Netflix and your partner, Michael, I think you said he was at Snapchat and Dropbox. So does that mean you guys, you do you sort of have, are you, would you describe yourselves as, as product people or digital product people? guys i guess so that is quite a an interesting perspective to come from so from that kind of digital product perspective you know i'd love to get your thoughts on on how you see DeFi at the moment and where you think it needs to go yeah so i mean you know our our kind of traditional technology backgrounds mean that we come at things from a very structured perspective to for lack of a better word we like to kind of put frameworks around you know how and why our companies will succeed and, and what we need to do to, to kind of get them there. And I think a lot of that is is shown in, you know, we take a very active role in writing the token economics of, of most projects we, we invest in. You know, we're very active governance participants. If there's a DAO, we sit on it. Um, in terms of growth and designing, you know, how this protocol actually goes to market, you know, we're, we're very integral there. Um, and, and even when it comes to building things on top of the protocol we invest in, you know, SNX.tools, which is a product that we're releasing in, in the next week, bit of breaking news, um, will really be kind of the first, um, you know, real big product that's built on top of synthetics that is not developed by the core team. And so we really come at it from, you know, the approach that, 
you know, we can do things like buying tokens from SaaS from projects. And, and yeah, that puts some cash in the protocols bank and, and helps development ostensibly. But these are really protocols and you need people to be active participants to build on top of them. And to really, you know, view the protocols that they invest in as, as critical infrastructure that they use every day. And, and, and that's really us. So that's kind of, you know, our approach to it. In terms of, you know, things that I think DeFi needs, you know, really kind of where we play right now is at the intersection of synthetic assets, AMMs, and leverage. That's, that's really where we think the most interesting things are going to come out of. And a lot of what DeFi needs is just a little bit of time. You know, DeFi is probably 15 to 18 months old, you know, conservatively. And and, and or sorry, aggressively, and that's you know the first protocols and the first first primitives that we had. You know, Compound and Maker, they weren't kind of what they are today. You know, 15, 18 months ago, and so really, we just kind of need more time for the industry to develop and for best practices to take hold, and for you know people to experiment and iterate and fail and and understand what makes things successful and what what makes things unsuccessful. And I think that, that just comes naturally. So, you know, I don't think DeFi needs anything radical. I just think it does need, you know, a little bit of time and process behind maturing as a, you know, subsector of uh, fintech investing. Yes, indeed. And, you know, you've talked about how at framework, I think the way you describe your thesis, it's quite interesting. You know, you, you've used a term called network capital, and I think you sort of make the case that this is a little bit different than, you know, traditional venture capital investing. So maybe you can, yeah, uh, just lay out what you mean by network capital and, and how that relates to DeFi and, and the differences between what used to happen and, and what you see going forward. Yeah, and, and I, I think when we draw the kind of demarcation between traditional venture and, and more network capital, which is what we do, I think a lot of it comes from just talking to traditional large VC firms and really getting a temperature check on things that they're interested in, things that are out of scope for them, things that they you know couldn't legally do because they're kind of hamstrung by these LP agreements. And a lot of these things are just kind of vestiges of them investing in priced rounds of equity or safes. And it's really kind of just been the status quo. And I think that what we're talking about is, is you know, not only kind of the mindset of venture shifting to invest in this new asset class, but you need to get, you need to think more creatively and differently about, you know, what's your corporate structure? Like, how are you actually planning on incentivizing your participation in network? Like what share of the upside do your LPs participate in? And, you know, as an example today, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, Coastal Ventures, which is a large uh, venture firm in the Bay Area, let's say that they wanted to, you know, invest in a protocol like Compound. And, and let's just say for the sake of this analogy that Compound had some type of staking mechanics, which are kind of necessary for network participation. That venture firm, that large venture firm, doesn't have the corporate structure set up where they can go and stake these assets. You know, what are they going to do when those assets come into their to their fund? Are they going to kind of give them to their LPs? That's uh, that's a tax event. You know, are they are they going to send you know these kind of minuscule checks to their gigantic LPs? Like, there's just a kind of fundamental dislodging of the corporate structures and mentality that currently power venture uh, to the ones that you would need to really participate in a real way uh, in this new asset class of DeFi. You know, this isn't something that we kind of arrived at, you know, randomly. Like we spent, before we started the fund, probably six months thinking about, you know, what are the best corporate structures? Why would we do this? Like if we were designed a venture from the ground up, how would it work? Why? Like what's the best way to facilitate network participation? And I think, you know, we've gotten to a model that, that really allows us to be different um, and really allows us to participate and build on networks that we like. Well, it's it, it's interesting because, as you say, your traditional funds or venture firms, they, they are just not set up to be able to deal with the, you know, getting their hands dirty, so to speak, with, you know, the governance mechanisms and staking and, and all that kind of stuff. And so from one perspective, what you're saying is you guys have designed a firm from the ground up to be able to let's say get your hands dirty and participate in and all that and do it yourselves whereas the other route i guess is you know exchanges like coinbase and and even binance now are 
making it they're handling the the custody and the staking and those governance protocols they're handling all that themselves so is there a is there a middle ground as well or do you think other firms will 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 they just bring on more like like a, a DeFi team to to handle that stuff themselves what what happens next there yeah i think you know people have tried to do this you know get a crypto guy in there or you know get like a DeFi guy in your in your big firm but like i think the reality of DeFi and DeFi investing is, is that it's not a spectator sport like you need to be in the game you need to be in the discords you need to be staking your tokens if it's something like synthetics and minting debt and hedging that debt off network you need to be opening cdps if you're a maker way if you're a maker investor you need to be providing liquidity if you're in future swap like it's not just a corporate structure shift it's a mindset shift and it's also a function of the Kleiner Perkins, the Andreessen's of the world, you know, they are very well set in a structure that, you know, provides them deal flow uh, once companies get to a certain size because, you know, they're, they're probably like one of the only uh, people in this ecosystem that can fund later stage projects. For us, I mean, it's not just this corporate structure that allows us to do these things. It's a mentality that this is, you know, a startup in and of itself. Like we have been successful as a fund, but you know, this is really, we're, we're taking a product approach. We're taking a, this is a startup approach. We're taking a, you know, we are going to do anything to win and anything uh, to kind of preserve what we think is some of our dominance in DeFi. Um, and I think that's just a mentality that not a lot of people have. And I think, you know, Michael and I are, are extremely competitive people and that's a lot of what feeds this. Fantastic. And yeah, that's uh, very yeah, well explained. And you're exactly right. You know, uh, DeFi, it is a, uh, a full participation sport, so to speak. And uh, right. so contact too, you know, it's, it's scary. Things get hacked, projects fail, you know, smart contract bugs exist, you know, you can get an audit, but who knows, you know, what level of, of kind of safety that that provides you. It really is a, you know, it's it's a kind of it's a thing that you're either all in or all out it's it's really hard to do it if you're kind of somewhere in the middle exactly right and so just to demonstrate exactly how far you guys are in terms of being all in from a, a skin in the game perspective my understanding is that you guys are perhaps the largest holder of Chainlink's native token link, but, you know, behind perhaps the Chainlink team themselves and maybe one or two of the exchanges, but you're a massive holder of link. You're also a big holder of SNX, is that how you say it? The native token of Synthetics. And you also have a large amount staked in Carver Labs on Cosmos. So, you know, these are, these are three, I guess, of the, you know, the, the better known DeFi protocols. Uh, I'd just love you to get, give some background here. Like, when did you start building these positions? Because I know that the chain link was very early. When did you start building these positions and why did you zero in on particularly chain link first and, and then synthetics? Yeah. Michael and I have uh, been in crypto for, you know, what we think is a long time. But I think if you ask like a, like a Bitcoin OG, they'd, they'd probably tell us that we're, we're relatively new to the game. But, you know, we kind of started investing, investing in things uh, like Ripple b before Ethereum really even started. Uh, and, and our interest and thesis and belief in this stuff has always been you know, this is technology. This is, you know, financial technology of some sort. Like money, it, it, like crypto is money. That thesis is kind of interesting to us. But, you know, Bitcoin uh, seems to fulfill kind of most of the needs for that. And, and we don't really see it as a technology platform that you can build on top of. In terms of, you know, our positions in, in those three and, and generally the rest of our portfolio is, you know, the rhythm we, we take more concentrated bets than, than most funds. And, and I think the reason why we feel comfortable doing that is because, uh, you know, we're, we're very active in the development, in the governance, in the maturation of these protocols. And I think people have kind of sometimes labeled us activists. Uh, I don't think that's, you know, a, a term that has a lot of great connotations. Um, but, you know, we come in peace. We want to improve these things. We want to see people succeed. We want to see our founders, you know, become 
uh, you know, everything that we think they could be. And so the rhythm of being a more concentrated investor is that, you know, for, you know, short, medium periods of time, you know, people don't agree with you and maybe the market doesn't even agree with you and, and maybe the price reflects that. And that's kind of been the story of, of framework for, you know, a lot of our investments. We, we started building our position in Chainlink on, you know, before the first day, I mean, on the first day that it was, you know, available as a token. Uh, and that represents kind of our, our angel investing uh, portfolio. But, you know, that was, you know, really the, the first type of investment that fed framework. Um, and people thought Chainlink was, you know, in various uh, kind of iterations, people thought it was a scam. People thought, you know, the team had ran away to the Cayman Islands. They thought all these crazy things. But what we saw was, you know, people building legitimate Oracle technology and that, you know, Oracles as, as a kind of another kind of middleware protocol could end up acquiring, you know, as much or more value than the underlying blockchains themselves. And over time, you know, we were proven right. And the same thing happened with synthetics, you know, synthetics pivoted from a stablecoin model, you know, as you know, around that time, we kind of started working with them to redesign certain things. We kind of picked up a large allocation when, when everybody thought synthetics was, was kind of over and, and, and obviously that kind of turned out to be in our favor. But this is kind of what we noticed is that the rhythm of being a concentrated investor is a lot more different than just kind of, you know, your traditional venture portfolio, even in this space, which, you know, makes, you know, a hundred bets rather than, you know, the 20 or 30 that we make with our portfolio. I think that's something that we're proud of. Uh, we're proud of our involvement in these networks. We're proud of the kind of closer to the metal, more skin in the game style of investing that we have. And I don't think that's something that's, you know, probably ever going to change. Very nice. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd love to just get the sort of the very high level bull case for for each of these uh, protocols. So, you know, Chainlink, I think, you know, as you point out, it has uh, has done quite well already. Chainlink has has certainly been one of the success stories of not only DeFi, but probably one of the best performing assets in crypto over, you know, the last 12, 18 months or so. You know, as DeFi begins to slowly mature, you know, we have seen Sergey and his team have have stepped in and, and they're really trying to do what they can to help not so much professionalize the space, but certainly uh, improve security and, and that kind of thing. But so, yeah, what's what's the kind of high level bull case for Chainlink? So for the people who don't know, Chainlink is a protocol that bridges uh, the off-chain world, which is, you know, events or price feeds or kind of, you know, change your, changes in weather sensors. And it takes that data and it puts them onto the blockchain. Uh, and that can be any blockchain. One of the functions uh, of, of blockchains that they unfortunately do not have is an ability to network and to, to connect to outside databases. And so, you know, Chainlink is trying to effectively build this two-sided marketplace. And on one side, you have um, kind of demand for data, which is smart contract developers. And an example of this is Synthetics, where Synthetics is pulling in price feed data for all of their synths. There's about, you know, 30 cents right now, everything from uh, Synthetic Nikkei tokens, which represent shares of a Japanese index, to uh, Synthetic Oil, which represents um, kind of a index price of oil, to Synthetic Ether, which is literally like a synthetic version of Ethereum. Um, they feed all the price uh, feeds into there. And on the other side of that marketplace is the suppliers, the people who are um, going around and gathering data from Coinbase or traditional commodities or stocks or bond indexes and feeding them into those contracts. And the link token really works as a coordination mechanism between all of these, these network participants. So if you believe in DeFi and if you think that uh, you know, the Oracle space that acts as you know, middleware for developers, but it also acts as this, you know, natural choke point of when you start to bring in data to a blockchain, you know, you, you have a lot of people that kind of collect that data, you aggregate it and you feed it into a smart contract, you know, at that point of aggregation, and if you've ever read aggregation theory by Ben Thompson, you have a lot of pricing power and you have a lot of power to do things that you might not at other layers of the stack. And, and Chainlink as the token that sits in the middle of this two-sided marketplace 
you know, has a lot of power to coordinate the network, to extract value um, or provide value to networks that it services. Um, and its growth should be some function of, you know, all of the new contracts uh, that exist on a blockchain, whether enterprise or consumer, and how popular those get. So it's effectively a levered bet on the entire uh, space. If you think that Chainlink's oracles will be the uh, kind of predominant provider of smart contract, which in our case, we see this as a very winner-take-all market. We see their tech is the best in the space. We see their team is the most professional. Um, so it's kind of a no-brainer no for us. Um, so that's, that's Chainlink. And I, and I know that was a bit long, so, so maybe, I, maybe I won't do all three. No, that's 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 okay. And and look, you're exactly right. You know, if there's one person you wouldn't want to bet against in DeFi, it is Sergey from uh, from Chainlink. You know what, uh, it's generally a losing proposition. <laughs> Indeed. Well, just, I do want to just touch on synthetics because I did see you just. I found it really interesting when you said that what you expect to happen when with the synthetics exchange is you see it evolving into a decentralized version of BitMEX. So what, what's the kind of vision there? So, you know, for the people who are not familiar with BitMEX, um, it's a perpetual futures exchange. Effectively, you can go on huge leverage uh, for any crypto or for you know, three or four cryptos that they currently have on the site. It's been plagued by downtimes, by consumer hacks, or by uh, uh, kind of sensitive information hacks. Uh, and there's, you know, a lot of kind of rumors about it trading against its own clients. Um, it's just generally not a great place to, to, to trade. You know, what we've seen is that consumers want a few things. Uh, they want no slippage. They want no KYC. They want the ability to trade exotic financial instruments if they can. Uh, and they want a place with, where they are, can audit and inspect and have a level of transparency on the exchange that guarantees that nothing shady has happened. Examples of shady things happening would be BitMEX's internal market maker trading against its own customers. And I think the beauty of decentralized technology is like you can look at each of these boxes and just check them off. You know, really doing this in a decentralized way um, is a consumer product proposition that you can almost guarantee has, you know, product market fit. Um, so that opportunity is large. There's a lot of different models that are going after this. You know, you have... DYDX, um, which is, you know, there's a centralized company there, which is regulated. Um, that's technically a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Um, and you have to kind of, you know, abide by those regulations in some ways. You're IP gated. Um, you can't roll your contracts. It, it's, it's difficult to interface. There's other models like FutureSwap. There's other models like Strike. There's other models like Derivadex. But what really is incredible about Synthetics is that you know, it's not only this decentralized version of BitMEX, it's also this synthetic asset platform that you can mint synthetic assets off of. So you can literally go up to synthetics with SUSD and exchange it for SNEK tokens. And you can send those SNEK tokens to your friend, which represent a synthetic piece of the Japanese stock index. And having this optionality and this composability is an incredible growth vector for synthetics as it builds out this features functionality. Not only does it have this collateral base that is widely accepted within DeFi and is incredibly liquid, it has the exchange functionality that allows people to trade against it and actually drive yield for the stakers of the synthetics protocol. And so for us, you know, that is is really, really interesting combination that expands the market size from something, you know, that is a decentralized BitMEX to kind of adding on the total addressable market of Maker and, and every other synthetic asset provider in the world. And you know, my, my shadow bet with all these technologies is, you know, there's only probably 50,000 DeFi users, you know, and that's being pretty generous at the moment. But we are aiming these protocols, which have such strong, you know, potential product market fit just because of the way they're built into the largest addressable in the market in the world, which is effectively financial products. And the interesting thing about financial products in general and traditional markets is that there's been very little... Uh, experimentation or development in you know the past 30 40 years within financial products themselves and, and that's a function of, of them being extremely regulated there's really no sandbox that a developer can go up to and say hey I want to create like a new synthetic token based on you know the, these weird arbitrary parameters you know Goldman Sachs is going to underwrite that Morgan Stanley will like laugh you off like this represents something that 
is such a gigantic total addressable market that you know, our shadow bet is that these things are much, 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 much larger than, than people expect. And, and they look like a toy right now. And kind of, this is kind of a Chris Dixon who runs Andreessen Horowitz kind of saying, but like the biggest consumer products in the world start out looking as looking like toys. And so, you know, we're super excited for that journey as, as these things that look a little bit novel and whimsical at the moment turn into these, you know, absolute juggernauts, which will not only kind of change the way that people interact with DeFi, but change the way that, that people interact with traditional markets forever. That's a, a really exciting vision. And it's, it, that is such a good way to understand DeFi. And you're right, at the moment, it is these weird little protocols and building blocks that you know, as Chris Dixon said, you know, or you said they, they do look a bit like toys, but that is kind of the, the power is the, the composability and the usability. And as they all start to interconnect with each other in, in new and exciting and exotic ways, some really exciting possibilities could start to play out, right? Absolutely. You said that there's only, say, 50,000 users in DeFi at the moment, and that sounds uh, that sounds about right. And so, a lot a lot of people that are playing in the DeFi space at the moment are either you know the the developers and and the projects themselves, and then there's the the, the speculators and and the traders, I guess. So, what needs to happen? You know, let's let's zoom out a bit. You know, so the one narrative is that you know DeFi is quickly building the future of finance faster than perhaps the the bitcoin devs can begin to scale out bitcoin or faster than the fed can print traditional money and the other narrative is that you know defi is a giant big experiment and as exciting as it might be it's a bit of a usability mess and it's a security risk and it's a giant honeypot for say malicious bad actor types or or hackers so there's this kind of tension between the two at the moment do you think that's a fair characterization yeah i think that's a fair characterization you know with on the usability side like ethereum is five six years old and and, and writing code in solidity is hard and the, and the tooling is is okay and it's getting better and things like okay how do we do Logins. How do we, um, you know, have uh, private key management for users? Like those are all naturally going to get better. And so, you know, I think the usability meme of like, you know, this stuff is just for just a toy and for experienced professionals. You know, that that'll go away naturally. I think something that's important to understand is, you know, it's it's like because there's only like you know fifty, maybe a hundred thousand, you know, whatever kind of monthly active users in in DeFi. I think people just kind of naturally look at consumer internet companies that have, you know, hundreds of millions, if not, you know, billions of monthly active users. And they say, you know, look how small this is. The reality when you're comping users from one industry to another is you need to take into account a lot of the behavioral aspects of, of how they interact with systems. You know, how much revenue is an average user driving? You know, what's the cost to acquire them? Like, what are the dynamics of how long they stay around? Like, are they very loyal customers or is their capital pretty mobile? In kind of trying to understand the customers and users of DeFi, an interesting kind of place that I found myself was looking at uh, traditional foreign exchange markets. So, you know, Forex markets, for, for people who don't know, basically were crypto before crypto is crypto. You know, retail speculators around the world would jump onto these bucket shop platforms and go 100x long Japanese yen against the US dollar. And like that was how people speculated before Bitcoin was, was really a thing. Like stock and commodity markets are for the most part, they're regionally gated. So like Japanese people can't just go onto the US stock exchange and buy, you know, Apple. Like they have to kind of speculate within their own kind of domestic confines or find something else. And, and Forex was really the only place that people could do this for a long time. And, you know, the dynamics of the Forex industry are shockingly similar to what we see in crypto today. You know, really high average transaction volume, or sorry, really high uh, average transaction volume uh, per customer. You know, that maps to DeFi uh, perfectly. Really high average cost of customer acquisition. You know, that maps to DeFi perfectly. You know, capital is super mobile in Forex, moving from one uh, platform to another if they want to speculate on different instruments 
or there's better fee rebates, or there's more incentives, you know, boom, that maps to DeFi. And so the Forex industry is hugely profitable and there's probably one to 10 million retail users of those platforms in general. But that's enough to sustain an entire industry and an entire financial industry, which is incredibly costful to operate. And so I think the next step for DeFi is it starts to look a lot like the foreign exchange market where people are trading Bitcoin against the Japanese yen or, you know, Forex kind of somehow appears within uh, DeFi apps and that becomes interesting. But generally, you know, I think that the underwhelming total numbers of DeFi users is largely underwhelming because people don't understand the dynamics of how engaged and how much these users spend on these platforms you know, on a given month, uh, week, year, uh, whatever. Okay, interesting thoughts. And I suppose, the, you know, the uh, the flip side of that as well, or I don't know if you'd describe it as the elephant in the room or not, but, you know, what about Ethereum? Where is Ethereum at as Ethereum slowly scales and, you know, the roadmap is, is slowly ticking off those boxes? Uh, you know, ETH 2.0 Serenity is sort of on the horizon. And... Uh, or are we sort of getting past the point where DeFi has to rely on Ethereum and, and the Ethereum devs as these new protocols like Cosmos and Polkadot, et cetera, come online as well? Sort of uh, how much is DeFi still dependent on Ethereum? Our fund does not invest in Ethereum color killers and it doesn't invest in Bitcoin. Those are kind of the two hard, hard rules we have. And, and I think that there have been a lot of attempted murders of Ethereum over the years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> feedback to companies. Um, and, and none of them have really succeeded. And the reason they have not succeeded is two things. You know, number one, Ethereum built liquidity for Ether. It built tooling for, for Solidity in the entire uh, EVM, uh, you know, they develop, they built a development community. They, they developed a tone of what is effectively, you know, just benevolence towards developers and a promise that, you know, no platform risk would ever materialize. And that is like incredibly hard to do. Uh, and it takes time and it just takes really a lot of, you know, people doing their job every single day to work, to be to make this thing become real. And they also have institutions like Consensus who are building things like Infura, building things like Truffle, building things that are core infrastructure to the ecosystem. And none of these blockchains will have that coming out of the gate and it will be at least another two years before it really starts to materialize. So Ethereum's head start, you know, is ostensibly, you know, call it like two years since it really kind of became into its own. But in reality, you can probably extend that another two years before any of these protocols really get any of this tooling development tone of their community, you know, in order to really compete against them. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, if you um, put, your sh put yourself in the shoes of a developer and you're passionate, you want to go build some crypto application and you already know your chances are one in 10 of succeeding on the most uh, public on, on the most used blockchain with the most users and the most liquidity in terms of token and the most contracts that you can kind of draft off and, and use to be composable within your application, you know, why would you go to another blockchain and cut your one in 10 chances of succeeding by another, you know, by 90%? Like it just doesn't make any sense. The, the developer flywheel at this point is spinning so fast for Ethereum that it is going to be next to impossible for any of these next generation blockchains to succeed unless they have literally a hundred X increase in, you know, value and value could be judged by throughput or community or tooling or something like that. But like, it's hard to get to a hundred X, even if it's from a, a few different compounded wins. Um, that being said, you know, everyone's waiting for Ethereum to scale and it's, and it's been a long time coming and the plan has changed a few different times and it looks like, you know, we finally sort of fly on a, on a specific plan and phase zero will go live in July or August or, or, or whatever. And, you know, I think it's a really kind of open question as to, you know, number one, does this scale in lockstep with the demand of the platform? You know, Reddit has trialed, you know, Fortnite and another subreddit uh, on Ethereum. And, and I think the reality that no one acknowledges is, is that if those users came over to Ethereum today, 
it wouldn't crash the blockchain. And so I think, you know, that's my first question as to, as to whether it happens quickly enough. And then I think my second question is, you know, in a world where ETH 1.X and ETH 2 exist, what is the value proposition for developers to transition uh, into their own shard? How do these shards communicate? There's just a ton of open questions as to the migration itself. But, but generally, you know, we're extremely long on Ether. Uh, it's it's uh, definitely one of our core positions. You know, you go to DevCon and you see 2,000 developers dancing like children and like Vitalik and like the... the uh, Ethereum Foundation crew like banging on Japanese drums on stage like that isn't something you can really buy uh, and I think that's that's also worth a lot and, and that community is going to be very hard to disrupt. Yes very interesting thoughts Vance and I, I think you're right it is uh, certainly difficult to uh, to fake that kind of developer uh, activity or uh, or enthusiasm to get on stage and dance uh, certainly. Just, just before maybe we, we go to a break and then we'll come back and finish off with the crypto conversation hot take round, but maybe just some, some final thoughts on what, what you see happening in the US, particularly from, uh, from a regulatory perspective. You know, what do you see, what do you see happening uh, that's positive or, or, or negative and, and where do we need to, to move towards? Yeah, I was actually just reading this tweet or someone, someone like said this during a video conference that was, you know, DeFi does not mean unregulated. And I'm still thinking about this, but, you know, it's, it's hard for me to see a world where something that is um, immutable and composable and has, uh, you know, redundancy at the blockchain layer where a bunch of different um, nodes are in the same function. You have redundancy at the data layer where a ton of people are feeding data into your smart contract. It's hard to see that it's, you know, maybe it's not DeFi does not mean unregulated, but it's hard to see how you would regulate DeFi. And so my personal bias is that, you know, we want to see DeFi protocols move fast enough and decentralized quick enough and get to their core, core value proposition in a short amount of time so that these things live outside the context of geographical kind of barriers and, and the regulations that go along with them. Um, that's kind of my, my first kind of point. I do think, you know, that there are going to be a lot of really interesting crossovers between the Web 2 world that we understand now, which is obviously subject to a lot of regulation, and the Web 3 world that, you know, as we understand it, is based on moving fast and, and decentralizing and, and kind of having value props that's not uh, kind of available for centralized counterparties. And so I see things, you know, like, you know, when you can pull in Plaid data or you can pull in credit card data, you know, you can start to bootstrap an on-chain identity that allows you to get, get it under collateralized loan. You know, if you uh, allow people to, you know, associate their identity uh, with something that is on-chain, you know, you can put them in a place where they're subject to the traditional fa financial ecosystem, such as debt collection if they don't pay off a loan or, or other things like that. And so, you know, I guess I'm kind of of two minds right now. On one side, I see projects like Synthetics, and, and I really believe in, in their worldview and that, you know, DeFi should be unable to be regulated, not kind of unregulated. And on the other side, I see projects that are kind of very boldly pushing the barriers between connecting Web 2 and Web 3. And I think a lot of how successful they will be is, you know, how much better of a consumer product uh, value proposition can you provide if you're doing these things and will existing DeFi users go for it? Or is this a way to bridge to a ma more mainstream audience? Um, so, you know, I think that's a long winded, winded, way, winded way of saying we'll see. Yes, indeed. We will just have to see. All right. Well, let's go to a very quick break and then we'll come back and we'll finish off with the Crypto Conversation Hot Take Ground. Whether you're an enterprise fund manager or a retail trader, buying and selling cryptocurrencies successfully requires price discovery you can rely on. Brave New Coins Liquid Indices provide trusted US dollar prices for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Featuring end of day or intraday outputs, you can count on the BLX, ELX, and XRPLX for accurate US dollar pricing for smart contract oracles, settlement price discovery, net asset valuation, and performance analysis. Visit bravenewcoin.com to find out more. 
All right, we are back and I'm with Vance Spencer. He's one of the founders at Framework Ventures. Vance, I like to finish each podcast with a very quick round of rapid fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. I just want your hot takes, your hot fire, take your best shot. Here we go. Where do you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-coin opportunist spectrum? I'm an opportunist, so I'm, I'm going to go with the latter. Yeah, I would have been surprised if you'd said anything else, Vance. But next question, what would you say is your firmest conviction, crypto opinion? The next big consumer financial application will be powered by blockchain. Very nice, very nice. All right, well, let's just change tack a little bit, slightly contentious, but I ask every guest this question. Who do you think wins the American presidential election 2020? You know, I, I think I, I think Trump will, will likely win uh, as, uh, as, you know, yeah. Yeah, nothing more needs to be said necessarily. I can, I get the vibe, I get the vibe. Well, Vance, Bill Gates famously said, we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. What do you think the blockchain space or, or crypto or, or DeFi, what does it look like in 10 years time? We'll have you know, two to three, uh, you know, five to $10 trillion plus protocols. Nice, nice. <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are difficult in the future. They certainly are. And look on a similar, similarly, William Gibson said the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Can you think of an example of the future being here right now, but most people just aren't really aware of it? Yes, uh, I think the prime example is me. You know, I, I come into work every day incredibly excited with 100% conviction that DeFi is going to work and the value proposition is just so obvious and, and oh my God, you know, how can nobody get this? And then I talk to my friends and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and so, you know, getting some of that lumpy distribution to be a bit more normal um, is something that, you know, we work on every day. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's zoom out. What do you see as the long-term future for the human race though, Vance? Do you see dystopia or utopia? I'm a believer in technology and, and the ability for technology to make the world better. And I think that, you know, technological progress is accelerating and I think the future will be fun and interesting and, and you know, we all have a lot to look forward to. Well, let's hope so. Well, finally, Vance, what is your favorite science fiction book, film, show, or universe? Donnie Darko. Oh, nice. That's a good answer. No one's ever brought up the, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a cult classic from, from the 90s, Donnie Darko? I think it was the 90s, eh? Uh, young Jake Gyllenhaal. It's uh, probably my favorite movie. Yeah, so yeah. I had to throw that in there. It's a trip. Donnie Darko. Very nice. All right. Hey, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for talking to me today. Uh, we've been with Vance Spencer from Framework Ventures. Please take us out. The microphone is yours. Tell the people where they can go to find you on your various platforms and where they can go to find out all about Framework. Absolutely. Uh, I am Vance on Twitter and yeah, I generally like to kind of engage in uh, general forms of uh, having fun on, on there. So just uh, tweet at me or slide in my DMs or, or whatever. Awesome. Hey, thank you very much for talking to us today. Great. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Okay, there you go. That was today's episode. Thank you to Vance Spencer at Framework Ventures. The link's in the show notes to Framework Ventures and also to a couple of essays those guys have written on their bull thesis i suppose for chain link and synthetics definitely worth a, a read if you're interested in those protocols also a link in the show notes vance mentioned aggregation theory which of course is uh, a theory by ben thompson of stratechery uh, that's one of the best tech blogs on the planet probably ben's a, a pretty smart tech writer you probably are aware of him but yeah aggregation theory it's really just a, a framework for understanding how the big internet companies have leveraged the internet to reshape value chains gain power over the internet and extract profits from the user. Vance also mentioned Chris Dixon who back in 2010, Chris wrote, uh, it's a famous essay, 
and that was called the next big thing will start out looking like a toy and so that's quite a good analogy for DeFi at the moment of course you know the the wider point being that all disruptive tech it often starts out looking like a toy and then BAM suddenly it's taking over the world have to see if that happens with DeFi let's hope so of course Donnie Darko I said it was from the 90s I was slightly wrong there Donnie Darko was actually a 2001 film it's a weird little film very very much a cult classic today uh, very much a, a, a weird little sci-fi psychological thriller and yeah there's various theories I suppose uh, around the internet as to the the meaning of Donnie Darko but if you haven't seen that do recommend it thank you to BNC Pro who of course are the sponsor of the crypto conversation there's a link in the show notes to sign up for BNC Pro it's just you know an all-in-one portfolio solution to help you manage your crypto assets and it is a superb piece of kit so do recommend you check that out BNC Pro if you have not before all right that was us we are out of here this was the crypto conversation for brave new coin coins